young singer named Justin Moore. We don't do a whole lot of bullshitting up here. We just get up here and play country music. Hey guys, today's podcast is sponsored by Bobcat Company. Check them out at bobcat.com. All right, everybody, welcome back to this week's edition of the Justin Moore Podcast. I'm your old buddy, old pal, Jr. the Handler, and across the Zoom machine for me right now is none other than Mr. Justin Moore. How you doing today, Just? I'm good, buddy. Just running behind like always. Yeah, name of the game, baby. Well, hey, <laughs> well, let's don't keep them waiting any longer. We've got a uh, we got a special guest coming in this week. Uh, I know we, we're going to have Parker. We're going to move him to next week, but we had a buddy in. Gonna come talk a little hunting and fishing and all things outdoors. Uh, since it is that time of the year, I know it's nice and crisp and fall down here, buddy, and I'm loving it. Yeah, it's just kind of. Once. It's weird because it it just uh, this past weekend, Saturday was the opening of muzzleloading here, and that day it went from being 90 to like 65 for the high. It was like it was perfectly drawn up. It right, was awesome. Yeah, I got. I mean, we've had nights. It's like in the low fifties down here, which is just phenomenal. We actually went out to uh, the floor. Bama had the musicians' appreciation dinner deal last night for all the entertainment department. So we went over there and ended up going and sitting out on the beach for a minute. It was just nice. The sand was cool. The moon was so bright. It was like you had a spotlight. You know, it was. Uh, it was nice. I, this awesome. is. It's my favorite time of the year in Louisiana. It never really got this cool. It all it just said like it was always hot in Louisiana. It was just cold for like two weeks right around New Year's and the rest of the time it was just hot. But here we get a little more season and uh I'm loving it so far. But yeah, we've got our brother Chad Belding from the Foul Life T V podcast, all types of stuff. He's I mean, this guy is a go getter. He is always in the middle of something. Um but he's having technical dis- uh difficulties and he was on here earlier and now it's pulling up, but I don't see or hear him yet. So we're going to give that a few minutes, see how that works out. But yeah, we got, uh, we, I thought we'd man, I talked to Wally the other day and he was talking, he had just seen Chad. Um, I thought, why don't we get him on this week since the weather's getting this, this, it's this time of the year. Mm-hmm. He played, he played baseball in, you know, in college and stuff. So I'm sure he's a, a, a sports nut like, like we are as well. We've got to talk about our Braves being, two games up right now it's feel good right. feeling i mean yeah. unbelievable still i don't try not to well, over too, try not and, to get too, too excited about it either you know yeah the, up two games uh in the uh, nl cs and two incredible games uh, they won both of those by one run um i, I got to watch uh the last one which was i believe it was sunday um we're recording this on a tuesday you guys will get it uh obviously you're listening on thursday um but uh just an incredible game they won in the last inning on in game two and and uh, the first game was another great game so they've won they're up 2-0 they won 3-2 in the first game they won 4-3 i believe 4-3 or 5-4 5-4 uh in the second game and um it's been a great series so far. Hopefully they can they can hold on. If I'm not mistaken, Jr. They had a two game lead last year and and blew it. I I, I could be wrong on that, but I, if memory uh, serves me correctly, that that's what happened last year. So we're going to LA now. Uh, the difference in last year and this year is we have home field advantage. So if it goes to a game seven, that'll be in Truist Park uh, in Atlanta. They're new ballpark and so hopefully they can hang on and and get a couple more and and move on to the world series we haven't seen them in the world series in i mean decades what 90 when they in the world series last 94 well they they won in 95 um and i'm trying to think if they got back after that I, i really can't remember I but think that, point, that, that was the only, of all those good years. That was the only one they won, which is crazy. Yeah. Point being, it's uh, it's been a long time. <laughs> it's it's been way too long. So, um, I've dug my Braves hat back out and been sporting it about the house and and around here. So, 
Hey, well, while we're there, why don't we just take a quick break real quick uh, before we have Chad Belding jump on and, and chop it up with us for a little while. Uh, for our, uh, we'll, we'll take a minute here for our sponsors and advertisers and all that fun stuff. We'll be right back here shortly on the Justin Moore Podcast. I want to give a quick shout out to Bobcat Company, who really does make a job, any job that is, easier. They got everything from skid steers to compact tractors, utility vehicles, zero turn mowers, and everything in between. Their products are designed to make your lives easier. I like that. Which means spending more time with your family and doing the other fun things you love. Y'all know how big of a deal that is to me. Make sure you visit bobcat.com to see what products might be a good fit for your property. Hey, what's up, guys? Justin Moore here. I want to remind everyone out there listening uh, that my wife, Kate, has an awesome children's clothing boutique in downtown Benton, Arkansas, at Central Arkansas. So if you're local, come see us at 119 West South Street in downtown historic Benton, Arkansas. Uh, again, that's 119 West South Street in Benton, Arkansas. And if you're not local, we ship everywhere. So uh, you can find us at shopthislittlepiggy.com and see all that we have to offer. All that my wife Kate has to offer, I should say. Facebook, you can find us at Shop This Little Piggy AR. And Instagram, you can find us at Shop This Little Piggy AR. But check us out. It's called This Little Piggy. And uh, see what we got to offer. ShopThisLittlePiggy.com. Hi, y'all. This is Brandon Bing, singer, songwriter, and whiskey maker. You're tuning in to the Justin Moore Podcast. Visit EasyLiquor.com to grab your bottle of Bangtail Whiskey and join the Blue Collar Swaller family today. Follow us on all socials at Bangtail Whiskey for more news and updates. Now pour a jigger and take this a second ride with us. Hey, gang. As y'all have heard, the Justin Moore Podcast has recently teamed up with Wrangler. Wrangler has been an icon in authentic American style around the world for more than 70 years. With a rich legacy rooted in the American West, Wrangler commits to offering unmatched quality and timeless design. As y'all have heard me and Justin talk about on here, George Strait and Alan Jackson, they're Wranglers. We wear Wranglers too. Its collections are also f for men and women, children, to look and feel great. Inspiring those who wear them to be strong and ready for life every day. Wrangler is available in retail stores worldwide, including brand flagship stores in Denver and Dallas, department stores, mass market retailers, specialty shops, Western Outfitters, and online. For more information, visit Wrangler.com. And you know you've heard it here, and you've seen it on stage, the Justin Moore Podcast. Dang glad to be partnered up with Wrangler because we're big fans and have been for a long, long time. Can't go wrong with a nice pair of Wranglers, y'all. I wear the Wrangler Retro. Uh, Justin wears the black one some. It's just it's my go-to. Uh, I get mine at Academy. So if you're uh, around an Academy or just about anywhere, you can get you a pair of Wranglers, whether you want to look like George Strait or you want to look like JM or you want to look like me. You can get you some Wranglers and you can do that. Whether you're in North California or South Alabama or Montana, Texas, Ohio, Wyoming, wherever, a pair of Wranglers will get the job done. Long live Cowboys and Plowboys. For more information, visit Wrangler.com. There he is. Nice Waffle House hat. You like that? That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I, I should have worn mine. <laughs> I love your uh, cowboy hat uh, headphones combo with sleeveless like shirt. I, I was trying to fit in with JM. You know, I, we, we just we just got a national deal with Resist All and um, – We've been living the cowboy life out here in the Western United States a little bit. You like it? Does it look all right? <laughs> I think it looks awesome. Thanks, you look like Justin. You look like Resu a pro wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, because because of my twisted sister shirt. I love it. I was thinking it was because of the guns. That's it. Oh, God, could you imagine Combo. if I had some? <laughs> you did a lot better than me, brother. That's why I wear a sweatshirt. I'm in the <laughs> South, sporting a sweat a thick sweatshirt. And you're uh, with a hundred percent for the hundred percent humidity, huh? Yeah, you're out there in the in the west in uh, Nevada, right? Yes, sir. Which is obviously north of us, and you're sporting the uh, sleeveless tee because uh, because you can. I I would be laughed at if I did that. <laughs> I don't know about that. I think I'm just holding on to the past too much, guys. <laughs> Man, yeah. first of all, both of your guys' backdrops and studios look awesome. Congrats. That looks awesome. Thanks, oh, man. Thanks, buddy. It's uh yeah. as, I, I don't as think you have as ducks cool fly into yours. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't think it's as cool as the ducks. Uh, yeah, those that's... are uh those are Canada geese uh, lessers from oh, the geese. state of Kansas. Yeah, yeah. 
That's uh, right, kind of close to Arkansas. That's down in southeast Kansas, close to the Oklahoma uh, border. Yeah. It, it, I, I told JR, I'm like, I'm going to have to apologize to Chad right off the bat because I owe you about, I don't know, 30 or 40 text messages or phone calls <laughs> or whatever. Brother, I'm going to say this right now, and JR can back me up. With my four kids, I have a list a mile long of people I need to call back or text back at all times. So please do not take it personal. If it <laughs> takes sure. me a long time to get back with you. No, no, no. Hey, I don't, I don't take it personal at all. And I'm always just trying to, I, I, I'm, I think it's kind of that personality to where that one time in my career, Justin and JR, that things got so out of hand so fast with the brands that you, I was like a yes guy, like, yeah, I want to get you this. And I want to take care of you there. The next thing I know, I'd move to the different state and start hunting on a different hunt. And then I was promising somebody else, something else. And then I was dropping the ball on the people I just left in Missouri or whatever. And I don't want to be that right. guy anymore. So when I told you, Hey, I want to get you some, I just want to make sure I follow through. And then I like to send a little congratulations. Every time you freaking go number one, dude, you talk about a hit maker, man. Congratulations on the newest number one, brother. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it, man. So for those of you who don't know, um, go check out uh, Chad. Has uh, He's got a thousand things going on. We'll talk yeah, about all of them. But yeah, he, we, he we have a better a, list of what he doesn't do. <laughs> yeah, it, well, that would well, it'd be an easier list for sure. Yeah, right. so, but uh, he does a, a, po a great podcast that I was a guest on. Was it about a year ago, Chad? Uh, yeah, it was right when um, right before When We Drink went number one. Or why we drink right. number one. That's right. That's right. So, um, so yeah, we we uh, and and you, I, I was telling Jr. that y'all were doing like a pool party type deal that day that we did the podcast. I don't know if it was a pool party. Y'all were hanging out by the pool, uh, whatever, because uh, it was it was warm and summertime from what I remember. And uh, but he's got a great podcast called The Foul Life. Correct. We we have the foul life, which is our go to hunt one, but we also have the one you were on. It's called This Life Ain't for Everybody. That, okay, my bad. That was the one you were on, and that was so special, Justin and Jr. Because my mom always picks an, an anthem for the summer, and that was her <laughs> anthem. And you dedicated it to my mom, Faith, that day, and sang "Why We Drink." It was killer. That's a good mama right there. Absolutely. You know, it's funny because I I think I told you this on the on the podcast, but go check out "This Life Ain't for Everybody." uh chad's podcast and we'll talk about the rest of the stuff he's got going on but um what's funny about you saying that your mother chose that as the the song of the summer uh is that song the inspiration for that song came from a conversation that i had with my mom we were eating it i think we were eating at chili's if i'm not mistaken <laughs> real real high class joint you know and i i, I drank two or three beers uh, before the, uh, the our meal got there, it was my myself, my wife, uh, and my uh, my mom and dad, and and she goes, "Why you drink so much, son?" I said, I, "And she's drinking a margarita at the time, mind you." <laughs> and I'm like, "I don't know. I just like it. I guess I, I it was really uh, you know it's I've been fortunate that it hasn't gotten me in too much trouble over the years and." And it's fun. I don't know. And and so that's where I got the idea. I thought, man, why we drink? I don't know. It's for a lot of reasons. And so there it is. So Moms. could you the 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 song though, man? I I think you told <laughs> me the story, Justin. I think you and DLM and another guy wrote it in a pretty like one day in a Florida swimming pool in a porch or something. No, you're right. Yeah, it was myself, DLM, um, Casey Bathard, who's written a. I mean, just so many hit records that that our listeners would would know. Um, and Jeremy Stover, my my producer, and we were down in Florida at our beach house, which is in uh, Destin, uh, that area, and we were hanging out by the pool on the swing, in the pool, out of the pool, getting silver bullets, and you know, and 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 I I I told him the story that I just told you guys uh, about you know, the Chili's, uh, interaction. And I said, I, I've got this idea called why we drink and it's for literally any and every reason. And, and one of them, I, I, I think it was DLM. It goes cause it's Friday. Cause it's Monday. Uh, 
because uh, it's charcoal burning Sunday. And I was like, yes, exactly. And then, I mean, honestly, man, we probably wrote that song in 20 minutes. I mean, literally. Drinking beer, uh, hanging around the pool at my beach house. So, <laughs> kind of fun. Yeah. Some Sometimes they come easy, and sometimes, the, you know, they're a struggle. But that one was pretty easy. I got. I know. I know that I'm on your podcast. I just. I've always wanted to ask you this because of your success as a, a hit maker, and Jr. can talk about this too. But I know that you're a big Razorbacks fan, and I know I, we can get into you know four and zero, and then they've had some struggles lately. But mm-hmm. I see how fired up you get on the sidelines. I've been down there with some of our <laughs> mutual friends and and yeah. seen how fired up Justin Moore gets. But yeah, Todd Ross and Brandon. <laughs> but do you get? Do you get that way, guys? When it's about to go, do you get that that locker room coming out of the tunnel feeling when you when when that goes number one? Are you high five and DLM and Jr. Is it like a championship, or is it just another day in Justin Moore's life? When it goes number one, yeah. You know, I, I get more of that feeling uh, when we're walking on stage than I do uh, when a song's going number one. I mean, it's certainly it's awesome. I mean, it, it's it's incredible and it's. It never gets old, and we're so appreciative, obviously, of that. But, um, you know, it, it's kind of weird. I don't want to say it's just another day, but it always happens on a Sunday. So for those out there listening, a song officially becomes number one on a Sunday, which means 99 times out of 100, we're at home. And so it there's not this big, huge celebration necessarily it's just it kind of is another day you know but you know it kind of beforehand that it's going to happen so you know it on you know maybe the sunday or monday or tuesday before and you kind of go hell yeah um all that kind of stuff and maybe you celebrate or whatever but the actual day sunday it's is usually like a bunch of you kind of forget you kind of forget about it really yeah. and yeah and t- there's some text messages and congrats and all that stuff but but to your point though like i get that feeling and i think jr even even though he's not the one walking on stage i think you would agree with me jr you get that that feeling of going into battle or whatever as you're about to walk on stage off the bus to the stage kind of yeah. thing yeah well yeah both i'll say something on both parts of that yeah the the number one the day the week of it's kind of like yeah we've kind of mapped it out you've watched it grow for 40 50 weeks or whatever it seems like nowadays and uh so you've seen it go up so it's like you're there's milestones along the way once you know it's rocking on along and it's making top moves 10 every top week. five yeah top I mean, 20 top 15 and then so then it's like oh this this joker might make it and uh luckily with justin they usually do um but then the actual day of and last year is not a good you know uh, example of how we would do it 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 seems like hell after last year i about forgot how we used to do stuff almost uh because usually we have a number one party and that's more of the the celebrating and the and the hoot you know the the attaboy and stuff because that's when everybody who made it happen from our team on the road to justin and the writers to the producers to the labels to the publishing companies and everybody gets together and we eat and drink and everybody talks about different parts of the song and stuff and that's more of the 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 big deal there that's when the awards go out and the plaques and all that fun stuff so that's but last year i mean it was just so whack we didn't get to do that you know it's just even for the one we just had it's uh they hadn't got to do it yet because the schedules are so wild and the way everything is right now so it's not a really good example of that but like justin also says we're going on stage when it's a hot crowd and the song's rocking and you know they're going they're going to bring it back when they start singing it yeah when you and i even when i walk out there and put your drink out right before i can feel the energy of the crowd and that's you know by that time it's it's go time that's that's the more of the that that rush yeah i tell you what's crazy chad is uh i came on your podcast um this life ain't for everybody um Great before, name for a podcast, by the way. Yeah, uh, before why before why we drink went number one. We stopped playing uh, concerts when that song was in the, uh, I think it was in the like mid to high thirties. Yeah, something like that. We didn't go back and play it again until it had been number one for a while, which is just a very odd 
thing. I mean, it's great, and it beats the alternative, right? It not going number one or it not becoming a hit. Um, but usually the crowd starts reacting to a song once it's top top 20, you know, because they're hearing it in the daytime, and that's when you know, all right, we got a hit or we don't have a hit. Before that, you know, when it's 50, 40, 30, they don't really hear it, so you never know. And so when we left it, as, as far as shows are concerned, we didn't really know, you know. And then we come back out, and it's a number one hit. It's kind of crazy. And then uh, uh, the latest didn't one. Didn't have much. Didn't have much was, was kind of the same way. I mean, uh, we put that song out while we were shut down or right before we got shut down, and then uh, didn't play it until it was a number one hit, ever. And so it was kind of, it was kind of a wild scene, you know? It was just kind of unheard of, or not kind of, it, it, it was, you know? Yeah. Pretty pretty soon, Justin, you're going to have that, I, don't, I guess lack of better terms, that George Strait type of live show to where – half the audience leaves pissed off because they didn't hear the hits they went on there, went there to, you know, planning on hearing, you know, you're going to have so many number ones that you can't only play maybe 20 of them a night. And, you know, like I've been to so many George shows to where you're like, Hey man, he didn't, he didn't play freaking carry in your love with me. I wanted to hear that live, but he played right. like 30 other number. You know, you're going to write. Can't, cool. can't play, can't yeah. play 60 number ones. Yeah. yeah you pretty can't amazing. Play them all. Pretty amazing. So, um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've been very, very fortunate. I mean, you know, we've had we've had ten number ones, and we've had probably ten others that were top fifteen, top ten, five, whatever. And it's just kind of mind blowing, to be honest with you. But um, it's it's certainly appreciated and and not taken for granted on on our behalf. That's that's for sure. So yeah, um, I was gonna say. A, uh, go ahead. I was I was gonna say, Chad. I know we want to uh, want to get back into hunting for sure. I want to talk about all that and how because we were talking before you got on how excited we are that it's fall finally and it's a little cooler here in the south and ready to rock but that that comes along with football season and sports and all that and i didn't um but we were talking about uh, since we're talking about music right now i was wondering about that how, i know we've got a ton of mutual friends half the time i'm talking to somebody at a party and they're like chad belden said hey and i'm like that joker gets around he, we got a ton of mutual friends if it's i saw wally was here a few days ago and he was he was talking about you and then i've obviously been ratliff we talk all the time so uh but how did you get how did your love for for music come about have you always been into music i know you i mean you grew up in nevada you played ball through college and all that stuff were you always a music guy too and as as well as a avid outdoorsman i was jr i was uh my dad rest in peace he passed away at a young age but um we were tight and one of my dad's major things was the piano the guitar and vocals and whether he you know was ever trying to become an artist i doubt it but he just had a knack for entertaining a, a campfire with country songs and it was always the outlaws and it was always patsy klein and it was don williams so at, a, at an early age i learned the respect of of music and, and instruments and how to play it and then when i i became of age and you know, i was born in 1974 so when it, about 84 um, you know, the, the hair metal deal took place. And then the, the, the hip hop, like, uh, Sir Mix a lot and Rob bass. So I started, I just started putting in my mom's Italian. So we were listening to Pavarotti and Andrea Bocelli and, oh, wow. and the three tenors and stuff. So it was always like this big mix of music and I never really shut any of it off. I could listen to Ricky Skaggs or I'd be listening to Motley Crue or I'd be listening to Axl Rose or I'd be listening to NWA. And I just liked talent. I really yeah. loved the lyric. I've always had, I was always, I tell people that are younger than me now, do you know what liner notes are or opening a, a cassette and reading the they lyrics don't. or seeing, and they don't know that. And so I was lucky enough to grow up in an age where I'm so blessed in my opinion that I got that part of the, of music and the revolution of cassette, eight tracks to cassettes, to CDs, to, you know, to now what it is. And I still always, and I still have a huge love for vinyl, which if I took you around my studio, I love vinyl and collectibles that have to do with music. So at an early age, I just started putting all together. My first concert was Twisted Sister opening for Iron Maiden at the nice. Lawler Event Center in 1986. And 
D. Snyder never cussed on his records. And we get there and every other word was the F word. My dad's looking at me like, what, what, <laughs> what? And then, so I'm like, dad, just let me stay. And then Iron Maiden came out and they had the devil and Eddie and all this stuff. My dad said, we're out of here. And he literally walked me up the stairs. But I'm, but in, in a nutshell, I'll, I'll, I'll be shorter is that. No, I, I love it. I love I, it. I absolutely love music. I remember my first country concert was Tanya Tucker and Sawyer Brown at Marriott's Great America in California. Wow. And to see her energy and then have Mark Miller up there running around singing his songs and, and i had just seen him with ed mcmahon on star search i was like wow. I, I love i love music so i just started putting together this knack for i love to get engulfed in things and i didn't take it i, I don't hear a justin moore song and be like oh that's good like i really like to get down to like how did they do that how did they tell that story in three and a half minutes and it went on i became a skateboarder so Bones Brigade and Palin Peralta and Tony Hawk and Lance Mountain and then the surfing and I, Kelly Slater and everything that went into that, then sports and then everything. So I just had, I wanted to develop a knack for not being a know-it-all, but not taking things lightly and like getting ingrained in it without being a heavy reader. I've never been a guy to open books and just be like reciting a book or the encyclopedia or something. I wanted to have my own touch to it. And music brought me there because being around the people that you talk about and our mutual friends, it started with the National Wild Turkey Federation. I went, I went to a hunt in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, close to Nashville, and I walked into a house and I heard this song out on the back porch and it was thundering and lightning. I'm like, who is that singing? And I walk out there and it's this cat named Leith Lofton from Mississippi. Yeah, and he's absolutely. singing this song. He's singing this song called 50 Years Too Late. And it was the first season The Foul Life was on air. And I'm like, hey, buddy. And he's like, what's up, Hoss? And he was the first guy to ever call me Hoss. The only time I ever heard that word was my dad and Waylon Jennings. And he's like, hey, what's up, Hoss? And I'm like, that song you just sang, 50 Years Too Late, which is a new Drake White uh, release. I was like, him and Drake White wrote it together. I was like, I want to use your music on my show. Do you own the publishing? And he's like, I sure do. And that's how it started. The next year at Hopkinsville, Drake White was there. And then it just started to snowball to where Ben was Drake White's tour manager. Right. And now and now I got introduced to this guy. I met Justin backstage with Drake White at yeah. Night in the Country in Urington, Nevada, and shook Justin's yeah. hand. I'd met him one other time with Todd Ross, but... It was just that snowball effect and that networking and to Bobby where, Johnson, that Bobby whole, and, I mean and, that and whole Barrett. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I just always respected what you guys do. I love the touring. I love the road life. But I also understand that the best part of touring is coming home to your family and your loved ones if you don't have them out on the road. So my life was like the same. I was bouncing, building trying to build brands and hunting and filming and I brought the music along with me. So the next thing you know. Here I am with Jamie Johnson in camp, and here I here I am with Drake White in camp, and then Zach Brown started coming out a bunch with me, and I'm like, how is this happening? And it's one thing. It's mutual respect and admiration, and it's the respect for the resource and conservation, and that Mother Nature brings us to our knees, and the Lord up above can bring a superstar like Justin Moore or Zach Brown, who this, I don't care what anybody says about Zach, Zach Brown's career or whatever. The dude live is one of the best shows I've ever seen, and... I've seen him on his knees and looking at the sunrise with mallard ducks in his face and he doesn't know what to do. And that's what it always did is that it brought us to this level that we're buddies around a campfire and it, he wasn't a celebrity and I wasn't on TV and we were just friends for that long. And, and it's just gelled into what it's become today. Yeah. It's a great man. equalizer, the, the outdoors man. And, and there, there are so many parallels between, um, I think specifically country music, uh, not only the artists, but but the fans um, and the people who love country music and the people who love the outdoors. I mean, they're the same. It's the same people, you know. Um, you, and, I love that word equalizer. That's a great. I should I could have yeah. said it in one word. It's the equalizer. <laughs> That's what it is. But but yeah, man, it, it, it's amazing. You see the sun come up from a deer stand or a duck blind or whatever, and at that point you're just boys hanging out. Um, trying to trying to uh, you know, get your limit, <laughs> you know, and so. Uh, but I want to go back. You said a lot there, but I want to go back to the Sawyer Brown Tanya Tucker show because a lot of our listeners, I, I would imagine, maybe don't know that Sawyer Brown. The way they were discovered was Star Search, which right. was the first. 
I don't know, American Idol or, or The Voice or yeah. whatever. Ed McMahon, and Johnny Carson's they, longtime sidekick, yeah. hosted Star Search, and they had it was it was America's Got Talent is basically what it was, and it, you could do any yeah, kind of right. any kind of talent you had, but yeah, that's a that's a better reference. But a lot of people probably don't know that, but that's how they were discovered. And Mark Miller up there doing his thing, going crazy, dancing, doing all that. But I'm curious, like just this is me nerding out on music stuff, and uh, in particular country. So who was opening and who was closing that show at the time? T- Tanya opened, and it was before Sparrows in a Hurricane. Uh, but there's there's a a backstory to this is that Tanya's got family here in the casino industry with the with the I don't I won't say their names, but a, a casino owner here in a big land development company is kin to Tanya. So there was all there was this old country bar in town called the Shy Clown. If you ever want to do research, it was like the 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 honky tonk. It was like Billy Bob's, not as big, but it was like the honky tonk that you might have saw in um, the Urban Cowboy when Larry, when when Gatlin's up there, the Charlie Daniels Banner. Was it right. Gatlin? No, who was it? Gilly. Was it Larry uh, Gatlin? Mickey Gilly. Gilly. Yeah, Mickey Gilly, Gilly and Gilly's. Charlie Daniels. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it was Gilly and, and Charlie. Charlie and, Daniels was the house band. Yeah, and it was like that here. So Willie played this place, and 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 all these guys that were coming through Reno because of the the casino shows, and we were like the fight capital of the world with Sugar Ray Leonard and Marvis Marvel, marvelous Marvelous Marvin Hagler, and all these fighters, Ray Boom Boom Mancini, and everybody was fighting in Reno and Tahoe, and we had a huge concert play a concert going here with the casinos, and then this little shindig called the Shy Clown had Tanya Tucker in there and one. So I got to know her music wow. through her kin here. And so I was so excited that she was like the big time at Marriott's Great America. And and then I was obsessed with I mean I was obsessed with Sawyer Brown. Still am. Like I like the guy's energy on stage back in the eighties was like like unheard of. You know, he was like the Garth Brooks of, of the early eighties. And he hadn't slowed Chad, down much. I yeah, mean, I we've done say, shows with him. He hadn't slowed down much. I was gonna say the same thing. We just played a show with him, I think maybe two well maybe nineteen. Um, and did, I mean, he had the same energy, the I mean, it was incredible and they got to be, I don't know, in their sixties, I would guess. And it, he, and he's still he's dancing be. around doing the whole thing. It was, oh yeah. It, it, dancing, insane, spinning, man. spinning, jump, spinning the whole, I mean, they were phenomenal still. What a band. Yeah, no doubt. Don't get enough credit. And, and, I, and had know. a, had a, had a great, um, had a great, um, catalog of songs and people oh, don't yeah. even, I mean, people remember the races on and this and that, but but man, some of those songs were so good. Like I'll take the dirt road. Oh That's my all god! I know. Makes, that mean, and uh, boys the like walk, me. Guys the like walk, me. the walk. I mean, oh, with my old man. Um, oh man! I mean, yeah. that was a huge. You know, that was was on the radio for years. Still is. Oh, Justin, you should cover that. I, I mean, what a great. And then, uh, song. how about uh, um. Cafe on the corner. Uh, oh yeah! I mean, they you, it, the list goes on and on and on. People don't realize how great their music was, but uh, go back and check out some Sawyer Brown stuff because it's so so good. But uh, yeah, I was like so was you, Chad. What? I listened to everything too, but I I, I still had the, those ones. Like I remember Randy Travis was one of those ones for me. I just remember oh. thinking, God, when his voice came on the radio, but. It no, was Randy Travis and Mark Chestnut for me, man. When Chestnut would hit too cold at home, I'd be like, I was just like, and I still am when I'm on a dirt road, I'm getting ready to leave Friday to do a dirt road coyote uh, predator management deal with two of my bro, my two brothers. And it'll be country music. And I yeah. real quick before I, I wanted to tell you guys one other thing before, about the, the, the networking, but we had our first sponsored NASCAR event in Talladega two weeks ago, and I sponsored a truck in the, the truck series on Saturday. Driver Tate Fogelman, Fogelman, 21 year old kid from Carolina. I brought some hunting sponsors along Benelli and Federal and Safari Club and Traeger and Realtree. Wrapped the truck in Realtree timber camo, timber camo and had all these sponsors on there, and we freaking won Talladega. And I would tell you that nice. to tell you this. I tell you that the infield that night was why we drink. I said, play why we drink. And we were freaking just jumping up and down. But we, I was in the pits at Talladega, my first time ever at a NASCAR race. I'd been to Indy a couple times, but we went, we won Talladega with the number 20, the number 12 Tate Fogelman car. And, um, awesome. and you talk about energy, mm-hmm. but that, that, that period of my life, Justin JR was like, it started to move into kind of the, the entrepreneurial spirit and my first company was a portable toilet company. And with that came special events. 
and I was this guy that could go out and talk to a, a, a promoter or an entertainment director at a casino, we started setting up all of our toilets at these outdoor amphitheaters and venues. And that's when I really got deep in getting to meet artists because I was like, Hey, Mr. Pootie, my name's Chad Bell. He's like, Hey, Chad, how you doing? Could you show me where? And so I become friends with Willie's tour manager, Pootie, before oh, he yeah. passed away. And, and now I'm lining Pootie up because all Pootie and Willie ever wanted to do was golf. And I got my family friends own a bunch of courses here. So I was like, Hey, I could get you on 18 on this day before your concert. And they're like, Hell, heck yeah. So then it just kind of turned into this networking thing to where you'd meet, you know, a Brooks and Dunn would come there, Travis Tritt, and all these people. So I just got fascinated. And, my, and the, the biggest thing that I ever watched was Vince Gill wow a crowd for like two hours when most of my friends are like, I'm not going to watch Vince Neil. That dude ain't country. And I'm like, that dude is country as biscuits, man. And it was just one of those things to where Vince Neil went to bat, went, went to the bathroom in one of my toilets backstage. And I was like, man, this is freaking cool. This whole touring backstage kind of deal. And my, I just got fascinated with it. So it kind of went from being at a concert to being involved in a concert to now becoming friends. And hopefully, you know, cross pollinating enough to where the friendship lasts over the years. Yeah, I yep, think sure. uh, for those out there listening and watching, uh, if you work your ass off, uh, it happens. Uh, That's right. <laughs> I think. No uh, pun intended. No pun intended. But uh, no, that's awesome, man. It's uh, it, it's so. As far as the outdoors go, and how you got plugged into that world, was it simply just you grew up, you know, an outdoorsman because of your you know your dad or your uncles or your grandfather or and you're in a great location for you grew up in a great location to be in the heart of all that too i imagine yeah i mean if, if you're talking mule deer hunting antelope hunting upland birds sheep elk nevada is amazing we're not we're high desert so we're never really known for what my you know my focus is ducks and geese where you're from justin is my my all-time favorite right i got to be in stuttgart or just south of stuttgart or in right. the grand prairie somewhere of arkansas so I follow my dad around the mountains and I love it. I loved everything about it, especially the culinary part of it. And, um, but in, when I was 27, I went on my first duck hunt with a guy named Jim Ray and another guy named John Sullivan. And I saw him turn this flock of gadwall gray ducks, they call them in the South. And they went over our head and they, mah, 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 and they spun around. And I was like, where was Holy that? Smokes. That was at the, that was at the sleeper mine. It was a flooded mine that the excess water of this gold mine ran off into the sagebrush and the mallards and the petal ducks would get in there and eat the sagebrush seeds. Our state flat, our state, bro, you know, is, is sagebrush here in Nevada. And I was obsessed. I went out and got the shot. I was 27. Like I was a late bloomer. Right. And I started, con and then I started competition con because I was I obsessed. My duck call company is called Jargon. That's located in Searcy, Arkansas. That's where our shop is. And Jargon is the specialized vocabulary amongst the group of people. Well, I was always obsessed with how people talk to each other. Why do pilots talk like that? Why do doctors talk like that? Why does a baseball player talk? Why does a quarterback talk like this? Why is Peyton Manning always saying Omaha? Everybody's got their own jargon. And in duck hunting, I was so obsessed with how you could talk to your hunting partner, a different jargon for your dog, and a third jargon with the wild duck or the wild goose. So I started picking up calls and competing. And with my competitive nature of being a college baseball player at UNLV and, and, and having that background of being coachable, I started to see some success on stage of winning some duck and goose calling competitions. And that, that led to, you know, me getting invited to film with Ducks Unlimited, Ducks Unlimited, Water Dog, Fred Zink and the 24 seven crew. And then in 2006, I was approached by a, a, pub, a production company out of Tulsa, Oklahoma called Divine Productions. And they wanted to do a show based on my personality. And that's how the foul life was spawned. And when I, when I was when I was getting ready to start this TV show, we had all the sponsors lined up. I got a phone call from Mike Devine, the president. He said, "Hey, bro, my mom, my mom is going into the Mayo Clinic. I don't think I'm gonna have time or resources to do this project." And I said, "Bro, I'm so sorry. I hate that you're going through that." And I asked him, "I said, do you mind if I try to keep it going?" He said, "Heck yeah, man. Good luck. God bless, and keep me posted." And I leaned back in my chair and I got off the phone and I looked to my left and I had this big mountain there. It's nine Arkansas green-headed mallards, all banded coming through flooded timber it's got a wow. redneck no trespassing sign with bb holes in it and it's got a plaque on the front that says strike up the band and i said i'm going to try to name a company banded and then i called my my intellectual property attorney brian hardy i said i know we're not going to get it but let's try it and we got it so in 2008 banded was born with banded productions then i started banded calls then i started banded gear and that's when the clothing took off is it first it was a t-shirt company where 
it was UFC tap out in affliction it mask and the guys had that show tap out on the spike channel and they were going from gym to gym picking a local fighter and they had this apparel company and I said I want something that's extreme in your face UFC meets redneck and so my first shirt was two geese looking at each other back flapping with their necks out and they're talking smack like geese do and Axl Rose had a, a song on use your illusion one called double talk and jive and geese cluck and double cluck so I called the shirt double cluck and jive I wore it on TV and boom here comes all the orders here comes the buyer John O'Rourke of Cabela's I want that shirt in the stores I want the calls in the store and then that's when we saw that we were on to something bigger and that's when Christian Curtis and Eric Larsgaard started designing the waders and all of the clothing that what you see now of Banded Brands, mm -hmm. which is an Arkansas based company now. Um, that's how Banded was born out of just leaning back in my toilet office going, I'm going to name a company Banded. And I went for it and we got wow. it. I was, I'm glad you uh, just uh, went into that because I was going to ask you uh, about uh, how you came up with the idea, where, when. Uh, all of the above uh, about Banded because Banded obviously uh, a lot of our listeners I would I would say the majority are are are, are outdoorsmen obviously and women and uh, and certainly know the brand Banded and and so I, I'm glad you went into that because I was curious myself how it kind of came to be so and I've got I've got the st I bought it. Uh, I've got the waiters. I've got a bunch of uh, a, a bunch of the gear, and it, it's awesome. So, well, and you, and yeah. and we have mutual friends, uh, Chad and myself, uh, here in Arkansas, as we both alluded to, um, uh, who, are, who are a bigger part of Bandit now than just when you started it. Uh, but uh, yeah, it Thank really God really. Them really really cool that uh you know it just that's kind of you talk about songs and stuff that's kind of how songs you're just sitting uh in your uh office so to speak uh and you just something pops in your head hey let's do this and then it turns into a number one song for you you're sitting in your office uh air quote office and um and you think man this would be great and then all of a sudden there it is it's a success so it, that's pretty cool and it's like you were saying yeah. t talking about the you know it all comes <laughs> full circle too because there's nothing like going on a good hunt with some buddies uh and eating really good like you were saying the culinary aspect of, of hunting and, and outdoor stuff that's probably one of my favorites for sure and then uh and then sitting around the fire playing music and telling stories and I mean that's just the full circle of how this all it all works, and that's neat to hear your story. How because I like I said I've known you for a couple of years now. We've got so many mutual friends, but I didn't know the complete story like that, which is which is amazing, you know. And for me, it, it goes even full because of uh, uh, Leaf Lofton and being friends with my buddy Wayne Mills. It was the one that got oh. me in the business. So I mean, we have all the you know, and then Ben and Drake being from up the road, and you know, just it's, it's amazing, man. It's crazy. I, I, I look forward to doing a bunch of stuff with you for a long time, Chad. I'm glad we finally got to nail you down on the podcast and um, and get you in for a little time with us. We've been just running and gunning this year. And I know we've talked about it a few times. You stay so busy. I mean, I was looking through some stuff you've done recently. I saw you had a – I thought it was really cool. What I want to tell people to go look at it. It's five things you need to be successful with Chad Belding. Um, it was on Dave Meltzer TV a couple months ago. I thought that was really cool. Uh, but I keep up with you on Insta and Facebook and, and Twitter and all that stuff. And I know you've, uh, you've, you're have you already getting ready to do stuff. What you what do you have? Are you in production of anything now? Or what have you got going on? Yes, sir. We, um, we're we filming nonstop. And, um, you know, COVID kind of put a little kink in our schedule just because, you know, you were taking a risk, you know, kind of like in touring. You know, you didn't know if you were going to get shut down or if it was going to be allowed. Well, hunting was kind of the same way. Some states went as far as not allowing non-residents. We're not, we couldn't go to Canada because it was shut down in 2020. And so we made a, a commitment to stay in West last year, staying close to home. If it did get canceled, we weren't too far from our babies and our family. Right. So, but this year we're back. Uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to be in about 15 or 16 different states. Arkansas being one of them, Oklahoma, Texas, Nebraska, Kansas, Wyoming, Wisconsin, filming in Wisconsin for the first time. And we're going to uh, we're going to put together a series of TV um, with stories that are going to bring the human spirit to the forefront even more than anything we've ever been involved in. Because at 46 years old now, all I care about it from getting out of the hunt and I don't get me wrong, I'm unapologetic about 
of harvesting animals and feeding the bounty to my friends and family. But there's so much culture and spirit and aura that comes with what you just described, JR. And if anybody can go to a duck camp or turkey camp or deer camp and have what you just described of mother nature and the sunrise and a wet dog and a cup of coffee and a four wheeler and a boat, and then skinning that animal out and getting the backstrap out of a deer, the breast out of a duck, and having Mr. Billy Bogey at Prairie Wings, Arkansas, cook it for him or his famous smothered deer steak, and then sit around a fire and pick and might have a cold adult beverage. I have always said this, that it's the finest place on earth. And I've been to the Riviera of Spain. I've been all over Italy. I've been all over South America. And I'm not saying that in a bragging way. My life is I'm fortunate and I'm blessed. I don't get humbled by those travels because I think humility is something that we should always have. So I don't get humbled by meeting Justin Moore or JR. I want them to like me because they saw my humility. That's kind of how I've transitioned my life. But I'm honored to be able to travel like that. And I've always said it, Nobody, nothing compares to Duck Camp USA, Small Town USA, Duck Camp USA. Yeah. There's nothing that compares to being around a fire with your friends, with whoever picking a guitar and sing along and going to bed knowing what you get to do the next day and just thanking your lucky stars and the man up above that we get to live this life. And that's turned into so much diversity in our offerings to where, you know, I'm so high and keen on this culinary part that we started a company. If anybody uh, wants to look, it's the providerlife.com. We launched 10 dry rubs five months ago, and I'm proud to say they've exploded. They've, they're going into brick and mortar and retail all over the country. There's, um, there's, a big, there's big talk about it right now. And our national published cookbook, we signed a publishing deal with Ben Bella Books out of Dallas, Texas, launches on November 9th. 264 pages, 80 recipes, inspiration, influence. How did I meet Billy Bogey in Arkansas? How did he teach me to to cook his aforementioned smothered deer steak, the best deer steak I've ever had. And I, I talk, I pay homage. I don't say this is my recipe because I didn't make up any of these recipes. Everybody learned them somewhere. I might put my own flair on it once in a right. while. But the provider cookbook, you know, living off the land. And right now, I'm also proud to say, Justin and JR, that we're number one on um, – um, upcoming releases on Amazon just off of our pre-sales. We're the number one cookbook on Amazon right now. And uh, it just feels good that all of that hard work and people seeing our passion for living off the land is coming to the forefront because we've been doing it for years. And, uh, you know, everybody thinks it's cool to live off the land all of a sudden and to know where our food comes from. So off of the foul life right. and bandit has come these podcasts and, and come this provider brand that I'm going to send you both a cookbook and some of these rubs and get your guys' opinion on it. Absolutely. You know, you, the, okay, the word that comes to mind with with all that you just said, which was a lot, is purity. I mean, it, it, it's it's so pure to go to a duck camp or a deer camp or whatever and do all the things that you just mentioned. You go out. Uh, first, first of all, you have the camaraderie at night, in the morning, drinking a cup of coffee. You get ready. You go out to your stand or blind or whatever. Um uh, you have the camaraderie with with the guys and gals in camp and the cooks and the guides and all this and um there's no more pure thing in life than that and and you know obviously there are people who oppose hunting and harvesting animals and doing all this but the same people are the ones who are buying um uh, you know yeah. free range stuff at the at the grocery store and all right. that and so um it, it, i i just love how uh how how those opportunities to go out and and do these things um are are are, are so uh good for the soul or at least yeah. for my soul i mean they're, well they're, you never you, you know, never see anybody you never see anybody upset and mad usually you know what I mean? I mean, I mean, day to day stuff, no. but nobody's usually in a. Even on a bad day, when somebody's hungover or tired or whatever, if you're at camp, even if it's yeah, the and, people and the that are running the camp, everybody's usually just in a good mood. You're you get and over the, stuff and the, quick. And the other thing is there. There's no. There's no race. There's no. There's nothing. Yeah. Other than other than just we're all trying to accomplish this, and it's it's just good. And appreciate. It's just, Good, clean fun, man. It, it really, really is. is. Yeah. I mean, and, you, it, you and, know, and if you're, and especially put. when you're when you're responsible too, you clean up after yourself. You know, half the time, it's like they say, leave it better than you found it. And it, you know, 
all our buddies do that. I know we, you know, that's part of the deal. Getting make sure you got the fire up and that this is cleaned up, and you know, taking care of it, and it's just the whole thing. Like you said, it's it's just good, clean fun, and it's a and, it's America. I love it. And, and Chad, so you know, like I, I'm a uh, uh, along with Ross, our our mutual friend. I, I'm a, a member of the uh, Arkansas Game and Fish Commission Foundation Board, and I, I've been educated. You know, I grew up hunting from the time I was you know a year two two three years old uh hunting with my grandpa and thought i knew you know thought i was well educated rather and uh i've learned so much being a part of that board uh, about all that you know uh the conservation efforts etc and and why you know all of the 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 hunting and the fishing and all that why it makes such a difference and i'm sure you are much more educated than myself and can speak on that even more so than i can yeah i just i think that the main the main focus is the education process that if you're going to be an anti and you're going to go pull that ballot box and cast a vote outlaw this outlaw bear hunting in california outlaw hunt they want to try to outlaw veterans hunting with a crossbow in certain states disabled veterans in a wheelchair that fought for our freedoms fought, fought for our country the inner fighting of hunting and what you said there's no race we got to stop the inner fighting we're all in this together i don't care if you kill a bigger buck than me because mine's going to taste just as good let's mm-hmm. all understand that the that there's a lot that goes into the conservation respecting the resource and the habitat and that when it all comes full circle and you hear one word sustainability are we really doing our part as conservationists and hunters gatherers and fishers to sustain the land and make it long term for your kids and your kids kids and your mm-hmm. grandkids and great grandkids to enjoy what our trailblazing grandparents did and our great grandparents and my dad did are we doing our job are we doing our part and you don't have to do a lot you don't have to dedicate a hundred hours a year for it and so our, my big deal, Justin Jr., is educating the people that if you're going to go pull that ballot, be educated. At least know what you're voting for. Don't vote on emotion. Vote based on science and understand what predator management does. If you don't, if you outlaw cougar hunting and bear hunting in California, understand what that's going to do, not just to the people in the communities of that state, but what it's going to do to those 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 populations of mountain lions and bears. It's not going to be good when disease runs rampant. So just understand and vote with scientific fact instead of emotion all the time. And the other thing I'll end it by this is that what you said, man, you grew up in a hunting family. I'm fortunate. I grew up in the country. We take it for granted that everybody knows what hunting is. So many people in our country have never even had or been allotted the opportunity. So mentorship is huge right now. Getting new blood in the pipeline, getting new kids involved, getting new men and women. I didn't start duck hunting until I was in my late 20s. Getting new people involved, taking the time and focusing on, hey, a couple days this season, I'm going to introduce this awesome lifestyle and culture to somebody new. Yeah, youth, youth is a, a huge focus of uh, ours uh, here as far as the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission Foundation uh, and the, just the commission overall. It, it, that's a huge focus because, um, you know, a lot of the kids nowadays don't have the uh, same opportunities and I don't know why. I don't know if it's it's parents being uneducated or or what it is. But um, that's that's kind of the the uh, one of the main focuses uh, of what we're trying to accomplish: educate and and because it, it's important. Uh, it, it's important not only to the, the the kids and the uneducated, but it's as you said, it's important to the animals. And people don't realize the the repercussions on the animals behalf when we don't have people like the three of us who do what we do yeah people and don't without, they, they, and they without don't understand people, it and without buy, people paying taxes and buying tags and 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 licenses and everything they have there, there's no money for management i mean you know unfortunately well, our, that's, our country that's, that's pisses away money right. on everything else but that's kind of where where that all has to come from and that's, that's such a good point, J.R. and Justin, is that hey, who's going to do it? You show me the data that, of what PETA, uh, and I don't, I, I'm not going to get on a soapbox or argue with them. I, I just want to see the data. 
What have you done to secure the the Atlantic Flyway Canada goose population? What have you done to put more turkeys in the state of California or Nevada? What have you done to put more sheep on the mountain? I understand that you have a policy that it's unethical to kill an animal, but I want to see where you match mount up and stack up against our sweat equity and elbow grease and financial commitment and focus of of caring about habitat and populate. Put my uncle and us put geysers on mountains for chucker birds and sheep to drink out of because we got to bring them water because we're in a drought. So we're out there all the time working relentlessly. Do we take a couple out of the ecosystem? You're damn right. But if it wasn't for hunters, you wouldn't see the Rocky Mountain elk population being where it is right now in this, in the stone sheep in British Columbia and the caribou and the Atlanta, the the Turkey population in America right now. I mean, I'm sure y'all driven through Tennessee and have a problem not running over one of them. They're everywhere. everywhere. The deer population in New York, you know, trying to say we need to kill more deer in New York, like they do in Alabama. That's because hunters have worked. So we're working relentlessly to give hunting a, 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 a vet, you know, just a positive, optimistic outlet of, look, you don't have to agree with it because there's 10% of us in this country that hunt. There's 10% of us in this country that oppose hunting. There's 80% of us in the United States of America that are on the fence. So if we can just educate them a little bit of, we know where our food comes from. It's not pumped full of all of these enzymes or anything else. It's, yep. we know what that deer was eating. That deer, he lived a great mm-hmm. life yep. and he died with not suffering and that's it. And, and if you could just get past the kill, I want you to go to a, a, a beef slaughterhouse in garden city, Kansas, or a mm-hmm. chicken ranch out yeah. West here and see what goes on. Yeah, it ain't ride, pretty. And yeah, I'm you, not saying. Or a hog ride by farm. The big, yeah. Ride by the big cattle farms out there in California and stuff. I've seen, that's why I always say, man. Whew. Or the I'm, other I'm, thing, I'm, Chad, like you mentioned this, this deer had a great life and, but the, the fact of the matter is, without without people harvesting these animals, sometimes they wouldn't. They would either yeah. starve to death, they would get hit by a, a vehicle. I mean, there, there, exactly there's right. so many reasons. Yeah. Um, and so exactly right. it, it, it's the most, it really, I don't care if you agree with me or not, it, it's a fact. The most humane way to go is to harvest these animals in the proper way way yeah because I mean, you're not because really you're not taking and them when they're the, small i mean they're going to be mature you know yeah and the other thing with in in relation to the the PETA uh, conversation is um i i don't really care if they believe it to be unethical or not this is just me i'm speaking for myself um when if you can prove to me with the bible that it's unethical then i'll stop but you can't so it says that they were put on earth for us to arise, kill, and eat. And if, if, if you go by that, then there's and, – and here, hey, look, you're a musician, a great musician. There's a guy out there in Texas named Uncle Ted Nugent that was just on my podcast, and he said some things to me. You talk about being educated. I made the mistake, gentlemen, of saying, Mr. Uncle Ted, we both agree that hunting is a privilege. And he said, Chad, and he stopped me in my tracks. He said, you know how much I love you, right, Chad? And I said, yes, sir, Ted. And he goes, you're dead wrong. He says, this is our right. We have the right to feed these animals to our friends and family. We have the right to bear arms and defend our our houses and our property and our communities and our, and our families. He said, there's no privilege at all in this. He says, you show me where it's a privilege. I said, well, it's not written into our declaration. He says, it doesn't have to be. He says, it's a God-given right to hunt. And he says, nobody's going to ever tell him different. And that's what he's saying is that the Bible yep. tells him it's a God-given right. And it's it's I, I'm like you, Justin, Jr. I don't want to go and say, hey, I disagree with you. You, you're not living the right life. I don't care if you're a vegan, a vegetarian. It doesn't matter. I'm friends with all of you. Yep. But mm-hmm. if you shun down on what I do without having the correct education and the resources for knowing what's going on, I'm just asking of that. Please don't speak out and go vote without knowing the scientific data because I could talk to you. I'll talk science with you all day when it comes to wildlife and, until you're bored with it. But I just want you to be educated because I don't want to lose my dig- or you know my lifestyle or my my love for the outdoors because we can't go do it because we're always getting shut down on things. And if people don't think that it can happen, guys, look at the ammo bill in California. You got to mm-hmm. get a background check to buy freaking 22 bill, bullets, shells to go plink around with your son and daughter. That's wow. crazy, guys. That's crazy. Wow. And if it starts in California, it's going to spread east. So we got to be di- we got to be cognitive of this. And we have to understand that this might not be here tomorrow. We got to fight for this right. We have to stand up. But more importantly, 
We have to be an ambassador and fly the flag in an ethical and legal and courteous and classy way. Don't yep. give people a re We don't need to go down the highway with our deer's tongue hanging out of its mouth and showing people. We don't need to do that. We don't need to put pictures on Facebook and Instagram of us piling up all of these birds or these coyotes and snare traps. Think about what you're doing. Think about it first. Don't make an excuse for being a hunter, but highlight it and showcase it the right way of respect first. And that's and that that'll get you a long way starting with just that thought process right there. That's yeah, a great and you know, point. And it's even more important now than ever because of uh I mean our populations keep surging all over the world. Uh, and this habitat for these for wildlife is, is shrinking. And if, if it wasn't for ranchers and, and people with preserves and things like that, half this stuff would be just another concrete jungle or more apartment buildings or something. It, it's, if, <laughs> at some point, it's going to be that if, if, if whatever we do now is going to be all that's left. I and mean, if, if it's not national parks and state parks and stuff, um, private land, that's the only way because it'll all be it, – because, you know, greed will kick in. They'll just want to develop. How can they make the most money? You know. Yeah, and another 100%. thing I want to add too, uh, to uh, piggyback off of Chad's Chad's point that, uh, which is a different point, but in Arkansas we have a thing, uh, and I'm sure they have this everywhere, uh, a foundation um, uh, called Hunters for the Hungry. So every deer I kill, I donate half of to Hunters for the Hungry. So it's homeless people and people who who cannot secure food for themselves and every deer i kill I, I or my kid kills or whatever our family uh we donate half of that to hunters for the hungry and it feeds homeless people and and people in need and uh, there are so many uh of those types of things uh programs across the country so check in uh to your local area wherever you are um, because those are great programs and, and, you know, before you decide, eh, I killed two or three deer this year and I'll eat maybe one and a half of them, donate it to somebody yeah. who will and right. who needs it 100%. because yeah, and like, uh, and like the feral that's, that's showing respect, you know, that's re showing respect to the animal, uh, and, and to the whole process. Yeah, it's like I know that a lot of a lot of states do that with uh, feral hogs, uh, which is, I mean, going back to that, if it wasn't for hunters, what are they going to do about these feral hogs? <laughs> they would just literally destroy our entire country before you it's won't over. Have any crop, you won't have any farmland Nothing. left. Nothing. And then they'll go into the cities and start just tearing through houses. I mean, that's what will happen. So, 100%. Uh, so, yeah, I love those programs. Usually a lot of the times the sheriff's department will do it or the highway patrol or something like that will co-sponsor it, and they'll get it to the, the homeless and needy people who can do stuff. I love all that. Hey, I want to switch back. i got a few things I want to hit you on, Chad. I know we've taken a lot of your time today. but No, you're good. I love I know these. You, I know you said you were born in 74. Or what uh, month and day? October twenty first. My birthday is this coming Thursday, guys. Oh, happy early birthday! Yeah, I'm a seventy nine model, and Justin's a eighty four. Um, so, are I, you I, saying I, I'm the oldest guy on this? You podcast? are. <laughs> yeah, you're about, and you're about to get a little, early, a little older. But no, I'm I'm with you. When you were talking like that, I was like, no wonder we. I've always uh, uh, uh we hit it off so quick and so easy. Hell, we had a much a very similar background. I was the same way with the music and stuff and sports just everything i was always into everything too but we do a thing here where we um we call up and see what the number one song in country music was the the day that you were born so uh being october oh, 21st 1974 um does anybody want to take a stab at what the number one song in country music was this year it's not a huge it's not one of his i'll give you all some hints it's not one of his biggest hits it's a female or a male artist solo not one of his biggest known hits to me. Obviously, it was a number one in 74. But um, there's a mutual theme about this this certain character that we've talked about throughout today's show that might be a little hint. I'm sure Justin might pick that up. I'm going to say it's uh, Still in Saigon by Charlie Daniels Band. Ooh, that would have been a good one. But it's not that, though. That's a good one. Uh, that wasn't number one. Charlie, thinking, Charlie, didn't, Charlie didn't have a lot of number ones, so. no. That takes him out of the equation. Hey, uh, but like you only need a devil, devil went down to Georgia. You only need one if you got that one. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, All right, he's. I'll give you that. He's he's from Arkansas. Is it Conway oh, wow. Twitty? It is. Uh, I mean, it is a big song. Now that I think about it, I mean, I it comes on the classic country channel we listen to on the bus all the time. 
Don't call him a cowboy. Nope, it's close. But uh, I still I see the want to in your eye. Oh, I still see the want to. In your oh, eye. I love him. Was yeah. he? Was he? Is he who George in took the place over the most? He is. He is. Yeah. He is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He, is. Yeah, he was. A, he was a ball. Sorry, he, I was gonna say he was a ba- he was a baseball player. I uh, want to. Grew up in, in Arkansas. Your then he went. Uh, then he was going to be a rockabilly singer. Went to Korea, came back, flipped country. His name. His name is really Harold Lloyd Jenkins. His tour manager yep. changed his name on the way to a show. They were leaving Conway, Arkansas, going to Twitty, Texas, and that's where he got his name. But uh, yeah, legend. Wow, that's I mean, awesome. Legend. Legend. I remember. I remember uh, a buddy of mine telling a story. My buddy Hal Brenny telling a story about going to see Hank Jr. one time, and Conway Twitty was was opening the show, and he was like. What the hell, Conway Twitty up here in his velour suit. It's my buddy from Louisiana, so, you know, he talks like a coon ass. But, uh, see, Conway Twitty's up there in his velour suit, and I'm like, what the hell is this guy, this, you know, this crooner guy going to do? And he said, man, as soon as that guy started singing, every woman in that crowd lost their damn mind. He said, I, I said, man, this guy's got it going. Whatever he's doing is working. But he said, yeah, I had the velour, baby blue velour suit on with the gold chain in his chest. Happy hair. birthday, <laughs> darling. Yeah, it just had him, just had him. And then he said it was all, he was a fan ever since. And obviously, Hank Jr., I mean, say no more. But, uh, but yeah, so that was the number one song in 74. So that was uh, a little Conway Twitty, a little Arkansas connection there for your hunting uh, hunting journeys we've been talking about today. I like that story. Thank you for the knowledge. I love yeah. that. Oh, I'm full of that kind of crap. We'll, we'll, we'll get, I'll get you on a bunch of those uh, for it's all said. Because I want to pick your brain on some uh, some sponsor type stuff uh, at some point too. But uh, another thing we we used to do here, we've kind of let it die out. Um, uh, but I want to get your take on this being a being a rock guy and a country guy and a because and a, and a, I was the same way. You know, every it transitioned. All the music changed so much in the eighties and nineties and early two thousands. It was kind of you know. No, uh, I don't like Nickelback, Jr. Right, that's the question. <laughs> hey, they had some hits. They made Who a does? killing. I, Who I, does? I bet a lot of people would swap their career for those guys. They had a I mean, uh, maybe, but uh, yeah, I get it. Um, I'm not saying I'm a fan either, but uh, no. What would what would be your? I'll do country music first. What would be your Mount Rushmore of country music? artist oh man um <clears throat> i absolutely love don williams and this is a General personal Giant. yeah this this would be a personal uh, mount rushmore not you know the overall scale of country music as everyone but it's just your personal mount rushmore okay it's gonna be don williams it's gonna be I've been throwing horseshoes Merle. over Haggard. my left shoulder. That song gets me every time. His whole career, his whole deal. The hag is awesome to me. Yeah. Um, and then I got to go with my favorite country album, Song to Song of All Time, is That Lonesome Song. Um, I think Jamie's That Lonesome Song is amazing. I think wow. that, I don't, know about his, I don't know about his whole career as a whole, but I think that as far as, Songs that hit me like Can't Cash My Checks or that, you know, that lonesome song or the one that Wally wrote with him, you know, between Jennings and Jones. I love that album. Yeah. I just think that Jamie did it the way that I would see an outlaw doing. Not saying it's right or wrong, but he's got like this cult following and he's got a, he's just got a, a great presence on stage, even though he's got like three albums. I, I think that Jamie Johnson's incredible. My fourth. Oh, you would have to ask me this when the host of the show is a freaking top. He's got top number one singles for the last 15 years of my When was your first number one, Justin? 08? Uh, 14. When was it? It, it, went, uh, it went number one in 09. Yep. 09. Yep. 09. I love I, your music, Justin. I, started, I, just don't... I, I started in 07, but it, 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 it went number one in 09. You referenced straight earlier. I mean, you, you, you got to put straight up there, huh? I think he's incre- I think he's absolutely incredible. But I would probably take Dean Dillon over him just because I I just love what Dean Dillon did for the man's career. And then I had a big argument the other day. I'm like, David Allen Coe wrote Tennessee Whiskey, and Ben's like, No, he didn't. And I'm like, Yes, he did. Look it up. And freaking Dean Dillon wrote Tennessee Whiskey. I had no idea. Yeah. So like. Like that guy, like Dean Dillon, I would you could he go on the Mount Rushmore of like him and David Lee Murphy would probably like share a piece up there for me because when I hear the riff of 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 uh, a lot of David Lee songs and his hits, I'm just like puts me back in that zone of the '90s and rocking to him. It's just such a hard question. I think that if I had to do it in two words, it would be Waylon Jennings though for my fourth. 
Gotcha. Yeah, it, it's so tough. One. Like it's so tough. We never could come up with one. We did months and months of this trying to figure, and it's just it's because then you got to say, well, well, if you do a female one, you do a co-ed. Because I mean, Dolly Parton. I mean, yeah, uh, you know, it's just Dolly's it's, amazing. It's, it's 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 so. I mean, it's so many, and then and then you got the younger stars that are becoming legends now that got all these hits you know and i mean the the justins and the uh you know the miranda lamberts and the you know and the jamies you know um it's just, i like uh, this cat i like this cat from texas that has a song called little rock and an album called little rock hayes carl i'm not saying mount rushmore but i freaking love hayes's songwriting yeah. i don't know if y'all oh, yeah. listen to him much but he's got yeah. a killer song about arkansas i think colin ray was a badass i saw call colin mm-hmm. was like from my area at one time he lived here for but I loved Colin Ray, and I think Vince Gill's amazing. I think, just, I mean, I think all there's. I, I just like real. Right. I like I like authenticity. And am I going to sit here and get on the soapbox again about what I think of some of the country radio today? No, I'm not going to say it. But I just think that pop is pop, and country music when I was growing up was country, and there was something to be said that of why it, why it's cross mingled and intertwined so much now that. A lot of the stuff I hear today, guys, it just doesn't like hit me in the the soul like Conway did or Ronnie Millsap. When I hear there's Todd Ross and me, I have a mutual friend named Marty Hesh, and he'll put the glasses on and he'll play his granite countertop island counter at, with the piano, the fake piano singing. There's a stranger in my house. And I just like everything Ronnie Millsap did. I was just like, I'm in. Yeah. I'm freaking in. Like, yeah. I, that's me. I went to see I went and saw Hank two weeks ago in my hometown in Sparks, Nevada. And he sat down and did Outlaw Women, and he did Dinosaur, and he did stuff that when I was a kid, I would listen to that and be like, that's the best shit I've ever heard in my entire existence. Right? <laughs> right. To, me, he, to, yeah. me, he's, to me, he's one of the best. Like, I don't know how I didn't put Bo Cephas that's on That's what I was going to say. He's, he's on he, ours. He's amazing. Yeah. No, he's There's a stranger yeah. in my house. Yeah, I got to put Bo Cephas on Bo in the, Bo is the cloud above see? Mount Rushmore. He's the entire cloud. He's got to be, right? Is he, he the, is. is he the greatest of all time? Yes. Hank Jr. is the greatest gotta of be. all time. Like, I, yeah. See, that's you put me on the spot, and I'm not using that as an excuse, but – he might be Bo the most C- talented of all time. Oh my God! The other things he did on stage the other, the other night with the Personally, bass, he, I the think lead guitar, the piano. I I can't argue with you. Yeah, I can't I mean, argue because I, I could say Hag and Waylon, but I, I but uh, the the law, and I, I wouldn't have said that a year ago. But and I mean I've always said if I had to be on a desert island, it'd want to be Hank Jr. with one person's catalog, all their albums, because he had so many and they were so different. Everything from blues to rock to country, to country to uh, yeah, you're right. standards to you know southern rock to blue i mean gospel i mean he's done it all and his voice is phenomenal he could play everything and he wrote half his shit or most of it i mean it's oh it's, yeah yeah 90 percent of it. yeah the majority of it you know it just i i i can't i got to agree with you like there you I, i'm mad at myself for not putting him on my original four he's he's like he is the greatest I, I don't know, like Brent Cobb came on my podcast one time and really educated me on a lot of the lyrics that I was unaware of that he wrote. And I just he I'm such a fan of him my whole life. You know, yeah, we way, all did the country. The country boy can't survive was right. like the anthem and then the yep. Monday night football stuff. But when you break it down and you get into his old stuff and, and what he did and like weatherman and the way it hits you, it's like. Yeah, he's well, on. Yeah. He's he's, pro- he's probably the cloud above Mount Rushmore, in my opinion. Yeah, Mr. And, and like you, Weatherman. Oh, and what yeah, is but, well, your I think a lot of that. Um, I think oh, a lot of that song. stuff you were talking about, like you know, country and stuff. Now, a lot of it's just not made for adults, is the way I, I think. I always say oh, that. Oh, that's a great way to put it. Let's I don't, go get a shirt or a, an eighteen-year-old girl taking. No offense to it. Yeah. I'm sure that Dan and I'm sure that Dan and Shay got all the mad. Yeah. talent, classical instruction, and and experience in their life, but they ain't country to me. Yeah, I, I, I don't I, know why people. I don't know why people get their feelings hurt. I don't either. I'm country. friends, and I'm friends with all these guys, or the majority of these guys and gals that do it. Person, I, I like them. They're, I want all my friends that work for them to succeed. But me I'm too. not. The, I'm not their target audience. I'm not Mitchell, a 15 year old Tim, kid. Mitchell Tim I'm 42 year old dude. You know, married too, dude. Really? I'm, I like mm-hmm. adult music, and I guess when we were younger, I guess we liked pop music for kid type stuff but country was always more adult themed adult real yes. life i give you the, i give it. you a great example because like there's an artist coming to little rock which i live 30 40 minutes from here soon i'm not gonna say which artist it's morgan and, wallen <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like ah, i've got all my buddies texting me going will you go will you go 
and I'm like, I love, I love it, but I'm, I'm not going. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. And they're waiting. Well, they're, well, they're, waiting on, they're waiting. They're waiting online for hours to get tickets. And I'm talking about people my age who are forty and above. And I'm like, uh, I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. Well, and like, and, whatever, and they but, they must not know you because getting you to do anything <laughs> outside of go to work and, and ball stuff is probably not going to happen. It's just you'd it go can, see Bo Cephas mm-hmm. though, wouldn't you? Hell yeah! Yeah, Bo Cephas, George Strait. There's a there's a handful that we would he would make. I mean, I went to see the Eagles one time, and they couldn't get a sitter, so they just didn't go. And I'm like, it's the fucking Eagles. Hey, <laughs> but- Chad, I'll tell you this: the two people since I've been a successful musician that I've gone to see in Little Rock, Bob Seger, Tom Petty. That's the only two I've seen. You didn't go to Guns and Roses on the comeback a couple years ago with. I was all I was. I was you were on the road. Out, out on the road, yeah. That ain't really a, a bag, really. That isn't really your speed. More like <sighs> southern classic rock stuff. Well, hey, talking about that, Chad. Hey, what wait, would be, real, what would be hold your, on, real quick. Go hold ahead. On one quick, keep it, please. I got to throw this out there because I was blown away on Friday night. I had a little pre-birthday party on Friday night, and I went to see Bobby Ritchie. I'm not. I don't know if you guys are friends with Bobby. I don't know if you know Kid Rock, but good night, Justin and Jr. Did this show? I saw him in Sturgis last month. Right, and it was it was good, but it was a different a different aura and energy. I'm talking like, dude, he put on a freaking show. I don't, I got to throw that out there. The Kid Rock's live show right now is better than it was 12 years ago. Wow. when I saw him at Bridgestone, I mean, it was incredible. So yeah. that's not a that's not a plug. It was just on our music yeah. conversation that Kid Rock. I don't know if he's ever had a number one. I think Picture with Cheryl Crow went number two, but the guy's built a pretty freaking cool career. Oh, yeah. With with all of those different influences of, I remember his first album when I was a freshman in high school. It was called Five Cents Grits, and it was like I remember when I spent the night at Sally's house and got nasty from there. But yeah. then he then he, then all of a sudden he got Joe C and blew up. But I had to throw that out there that the concert was pretty freaking spectacular. Yeah, he's a he's a rock star, no doubt. I got a call the other day from uh, John Party Facetime me, and he's hanging out with Ric Flair at Kid Rock's house, and I'm just like. <laughs> And I see all these other people walk around. I'm just like, good night. And uh, so anyway, yeah, I know Bobby. Good guy. Good guy. And yeah, one of one of the best shows. Uh, always has been. I hadn't Incredible. seen it lately. So if it's if it's up a notch from what it what it always has been, then I, I, I that'd be one I would definitely go see. And I do. I go meet. Um, I go meet. I've got friends. Hank Junior's tour manager, his tour manager, good buddies of mine, a couple guys in the band. So I. I Usually in the off season, I'll go so see Bo Cephas once or twice if I can. I'll get uh, my buddy Terry from Party's Band and his wife to meet us, and we'll go to New Orleans or something. Um, but I'm kind of the same way, too. I get people ask me. I live right here. I live in Gulf Shores, Alabama, so I live 10 minutes, five minutes from the Wharf Amphitheater. And, oh, um, you know, and, and there's always big, good – There's the killer acts come through. And uh, even if I like their music, it's not – I just – I just got a lot to do. I just don't feel like I'm ever caught up. I just don't do that much. I, you know, I, I'll venture. I'll, I'm more apt to venture out and see some up and coming artist or uh, regional artist that I'm, I like um, on my days off the road. Now, at a show day, if we're somewhere and we're playing a bill with a bunch of acts and stuff, I'll make sure to be side stage to see the ones I want to see and all that stuff. But, uh, but yeah, going back to the music thing, I, I feel like uh, like we're saying it's just more, you know, um, it's just not. Not that I don't like it; it's just not for me. A lot of it's not; it's not meant to be for me. You know, they're not. I'm not the target audience. But um, talking about rock and roll, because Justin mentioned his favorite all-time American rock and roll uh, is Tom Petty. What would be your uh, What would be your upper Mount Rushmore of rock stuff since you came up in the rock? Uh, you've mentioned GNR a few times. Has that got to be one? Yeah, hands down. I think Appetite was so far ahead of its time. I think that from lyrics on the albums, obviously, short career. Uh, I just, I don't know. I just never had songs hit me. I, I love Zeppelin. I love Freddie Mercury. I love the crew. I like the danger of, of Motley Crue. They were different than the hair bands on Sunset Boulevard. Um, but I love Southern rock. I love the guitar. I love Tedeschi Trucks. I love her voice. Yeah. I love the way that Dar- that he plays the guitar. I love everything there is to know about Skinner and Allman Brothers and, and, and Hank and Charlie Daniels and the history of what went on down there. I don't know at all. I'm not, I'm not a, a historian on it, but I just, I grew up in a time period in that mid eighties that it was always like, I loved quiet Riot. I thought they were dangerous. And then you had the poisons and the warrants and the, and the Dawkins and kind of the big hair. But then there was Rodney James Dio and I love freaking Holy Diver and rainbow in the dark and last in line. And, um, but I, I, it was, it was that, it was those four bands. It was quiet riot, twisted sister Dio. And, um, did I say Cinderella? 
No, that's Cinderella. No. Those were the four. And then in 86, when Appetite was, was released, I was like, and it was MTV days, man. So I got to see him sitting there in the jungle video and then the sweet child of mine video and then the paradise city. And then I heard rocket queen and all that. And it was just, well, who the hell are these guys? Too? Yeah. It was just yeah. dangerous. Right. And yeah. then, and then, and then patience came out on the lies album. And I think that Axl Rose by far is the best front man of vocal range of all time. I'm not saying that this is proven, but I'm just saying that in my opinion, the way that he could hit those notes and run around that stage on the 92 use your illusion tour just amazing. If you watch the 86 show live at the Ritz, amazing what he did on stage. So I would say that my favorite rock band of all time, based on lyrics, stage presence, instrumentals, and creativity, but also had that danger and didn't play by any of the rules, is Guns N' Roses. Yeah, I mean, they, I mean, huge, huge. I mean, as big a band as there ever was. I don't, I'm not as big of a fan of theirs as some of those uh, of their contemporaries but uh yeah no doubt and then and then it and then i remember when all that's when that kind of transitioned into over when hip-hop kind of started taking over as the dominant format there and then it got um you know it was just uh it was a great time for music you know the 70s were awesome with what they had i'll tell you a fun fact talking about those bands one of the greatest southern rock bands of all time was a band called wet willie uh and they were based out of mobile alabama and their front man jimmy hall um, is actually Hank Jr.'s band leader and has been for, for years and years. So uh, when you see Hank Jr. play, you're actually seeing a, a Southern Rock uh, icon uh, up there as well. Most people don't even know that. And his other job is, wow. uh, is sideman for Jeff Beck. So I mean, that's his two gigs, Jeff Beck and uh, and Hank Jr. So, well, yeah, shout Jeff out to Beck's a, he's not a very good guitar player, is no, he? No, no, I'm not. I'll, <laughs> incredible. I'll smoke him. I'll smoke him. Well, hey, well, I know we got to get out of here. We've uh, we've had you on here long enough, Chad. I appreciate you spending some time with us today. I want to make sure everybody um, comes to visit you on social media and 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 watches your shows and downloads the podcast. Podcast again, you can let everybody know where that's at. I know I follow you on uh, at the Foul Life um, TV TV yep. on Instagram and Twitter. Um, how, the, how what's the names of the podcast here? Everybody find those. It started in 2009, Jr. and Justin Moore. I was in Losers in Midtown Nashville, and I was watching the band, and I'd never been to a bar like Losers. I was like, dude, Nashville's the coolest place on earth. I mean, I go there a ton now. But behind the band where they stand down in that little lower section in the main room there in Losers, there's this sign up behind them that said, this life ain't for everybody. And with my mind and intellectual property, I'm like, I'm going to try to trademark that. So I trademarked that in 2000 early early in the 2010 time range. And then that's where I got the name for the podcast. And it wasn't meant to be like, my life's difficult or, hey, you can't do what I do. It was like, hey, what Justin does isn't for me. I, I can't write a song like that with David Lee Murphy, make it a number one hit and sing like that guy. I can't do what the garbage man does every Thursday at my house. He, he's put on earth, he takes a lot of pride doing that. The high school janitors, they're whistling Dixie while they're making sure our kids have a clean school environment to go to, right? I just love passion. And right. so the whole, the, the whole thesis of that um, podcast was, hey, there's all these different walks of life and my network has got to expand because of the outdoors. And I, I'm honored to have everybody on that show like Justin's been on there. And, and so that's This Life Ain't For Everybody. You can see that on uh, thislifeaintforeverybody.com. And then the providerlife.com is our culinary company. And I hope that you all get your hands on a cookbook. The rubs have taken off. They're, they're, they're just so good to cook with. I love grilling out um, dry rub style. And then we're uh, currently in season 13 on the outdoor channel of the Foul Life TV. We're getting ready to hit the road. We've already filmed a couple hunts for season 14 of Benelli's The Foul Life. And we have seven strong episodes that go to air on November 2nd or 3rd that are going to tell a story of con everything we spoke about in the first 30 minutes of this conversation of what hunters do for wildlife and farmers and ranchers and sustainability and what it means to have our military fighting for our freedoms to protect our rights, to get to wake up safely and put our feet on dirt to go hunt because there's a lot of countries you don't get to hunt. And I'm just so blessed that we get to here and I want to showcase it on these new episodes of the foul life of, Hey, let's, uh, let's work together. Let's stop the inner fighting because there's a lot bigger fish to fry than who kills the most ducks. It shouldn't matter. That trigger pulls very minute part of how special this lifestyle is. So yeah, season 13 outdoor channel, we'll have brand new episodes, seven weeks in a row, starting November 2nd. And I'm fired up for them. And besides that, man, the podcasts are awesome. The foul life is, we got some good guests coming up and can't wait to get, get out on the road and see a Justin Moore live show and raise my uh, solo cup and sing a little, uh, why we drink. 
Absolutely. Well, hey, well, we're going to be uh, – I'm going to go run down our dates real quick while we got you on, and we'll wrap this thing up uh, this weekend. I'm not sure when this is going to drop because I know Cody's uh, um, on uh, – our. Uh, our producer and dear friend and video content manager works for our management company. Um, does all our social stuff. He's at he's from Urington, Nevada, um, and uh, that's where we met him. Was that same night when we met you? And he's worked for us with us ever since. But uh, he's actually on a hunt with his sister somewhere remote. I know he was telling me they were going in some high country somewhere, hunting something. He wasn't going to have service for about a week. So this may come out this weekend. It was I'm elk. Maybe it was elk. Is that what he's going to hunt? Yep. Um, so this may come out Friday or Saturday of this week, but uh, it, as it drops Friday, we'll be in Huntsville, Alabama, Saturday, Corbin, Kentucky. Then next week, we've got one show in Hanover, Maryland, live at the hall there. Y'all come see us. Uh, then the next week, we're heading out west. Um, we've got a show in uh, Arizona, uh, and then we've got a show in Laughlin, uh, Nevada. Is uh, How far is that from you, Chad? That's Vegas, but what, what date's Laughlin? Uh, Saturday the 6th. Of November. Yes, sir. I think I'm coming to it. I'll haul it. I think I'm going to fly down for it. Yeah, let's talk about that because I had another idea too. We were talking about metal earlier. You remember that show, The Metal Show with Eddie Trunk? Yeah, I love Eddie Trunk. Dude, that show was so awesome. We need, uh, we should, uh, nobody steal this idea. We should do a country version of that and I'll be the Eddie Trunk type person because I'm pretty knowledgeable. I love that. Well, the the knowledge that you dropped on me today, like I think, I think that that stuff is so important to remember where we came from. A lot of our history is being torn down before our eyes. And I love to know that you just taught me about Wet Willie and what I was watching on stage with. I mean, yeah. can you imagine being eight years old and walking into your daddy's living room and seeing Elvis Presley and Little Richard sitting in there? Like, that's the stories that Hank tells. Yeah. Could you imagine? Like, I love learning that kind of stuff, man. Yeah, so Fats a show Domino. like that would be killer. I mean, yeah, he's, yeah, he's Fats killer, Domino right? showing him this lick. Yeah, absolutely. So that's that's what we've got. <laughs> and, that, and, this is, and this is winding down our year. So Laughlin, which is outside of Vegas on Saturday the 6th. Then we go St. Louis Obispo out in California on the 7th. Uh, then we come back and we're going to do uh, St. Augustine, Florida on November 11th, Biloxi, Mississippi. Uh, November 12th, and Lake Charles, Louisiana on November 13th to wind down our touring year, uh, which is crazy. It came and went, and it, was, it seems like just yesterday we were like, oh, my God, we're about to have to do three months nonstop, and now it's winding down. So uh, y'all be sure to out there to come come to a show. Uh, I'm JR The Handler. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at JR The Handler or on jrthehandler.com, uh, as well as justinmoremusic.com. You can find all links to all these shows, tickets, all that fun stuff, all Justin's videos, news, anything like that, merchandise, all that on Justin's website. He's at Justin Cole Moore on Instagram and Twitter. And I want to say thanks again to our brother Chad Belding from The Foul Life coming on and dropping some uh, some some knowledge and, and some uh, info on us and, and just getting to have a good hang. That's basically why we started this thing was like a BS set. Session and I sure enjoyed today's. It means more to me than I could ever explain to both of you. To uh, be invited on is unbelievable and uh, enjoy it all of my time. And hopefully, we get to hang out in person soon. Yeah, for sure. I'm going to put, yeah, we'll make sure to get links to all this stuff up in our in our notes too, so our listeners and uh, watchers can all go uh, find find all that stuff. Yeah, Chad, thanks so much, man. I, I, I really do appreciate your time and it was awesome. And um, hopefully, we'll as you said, get to hang in person soon, man. And I know that you have a complete set list, Justin. I'm just, you heard me sing, uh, that's the way love goes. If you want to run that up and bring me up just to throw down that's a little bit in front of that Laughlin crowd. That's the way love goes, Dude, that would be You got to wear that cowboy hat. Music got me. What, what, kind, what cowboy hat are you wearing, Justin, before we sign off? What do you, I, what brand do you wear? I wear a bull hide. Uh, bull they, hide. We have a Justin Moore line of cowboy hats uh, by Bullhide. So, um, yeah. I love it. Yeah, well, well man, get, I, I appreciate it, guys. Yeah, heck yeah. And I want to, uh, I want to get to Arkansas. I had actually had a conversation on Arkansas this morning. I'll, I'll text you my dates and see if we can uh, make something work depending on your guys' uh, touring schedule. Awesome. Sounds great. Well, don't man. be getting all don't be getting all weirded out when you see if text come through now, Justin. I saw that look in your face. No, like, no, oh god. No. <laughs> just start no, it off I'm by just... saying something about Arkansas football, then he'll pay attention. Then he then you put put what you really need in there after the first line. That's what I do. <laughs> right. That's what I'm gonna do. 
Yeah. Saw, y'all got a big five, saw y'all got a big five-star recruit today. So, going to be in your uh, neck of the woods next week. You'll be around. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now I got – now JR educated me. That's how he handles it. JR the handler just educated me on how to text uh, Justin Colmore. That's it, I'm buddy. It. Well, man, thank both you guys. We uh, This has been uh, season three, episode 34 of the Justin, po- Justin Moore podcast uh, with our brother, Mr. Justin Moore. Thank you for your time, as always. The brother, Chad Belding, thanks for stopping in with us today. And we'll see you guys and gals here next week on the Justin Moore Podcast. Remember to use the hashtag Justin Moore Podcast when you interact with us on social media. Uh, Like, click, subscribe, notification, all those fun stuff. Leave us a review if you can, and we'll see y'all next week. Thanks, everybody. Hey, guys, today's podcast is sponsored by Bobcat Company. Check them out at bobcat.com. For any of you first-time listeners out there, at the end of each of our episodes, uh, I like to do a little reading out of a book I've had that I've got a lot of use out of over the years. Uh, the book is by Mr. Charlie Daniels, uh, and the book is called Let's All Make the Day Count, The Everyday Wisdom of Charlie Daniels. Number 25, Making Peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Matthew 5, 9. Being a peacemaker does not brand you as some softy who is afraid of his own shadow and who tries to placate evil and injustice at any price. The same Bible that says blessed are the peacemakers also tells us why we shouldn't stand by and watch defenseless, let the defenseless be mistreated or let wickedness flourish. Sometimes making peace takes drastic measures. Ronald Reagan advocated peace through strength and built the mightiest military the planet had ever known. He stood ready to use it and stared down the Russians. It resulted in the tearing down of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War. The Prince of Peace will return to the earth with a mighty army to destroy all evil and create a real peace. Undaunted by the satanic forces that have plagued mankind since the Garden of Eden. On a person to person level, I believe that God wants us to help mediate arguments and disagreements when the occasion presents itself. We should maintain peace in our own relationships and promote peaceful solutions whenever we can. We will only know true and unending peace when we come to come into the presence of our creator until then i believe that he wants us to be peacemakers whatever that entails first of all make peace with yourself let's all make the day count